All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another session of Virtual Global Spine Conference. I'm really excited to, um, to have our, our guest here, Dr. Bill Clifton. He is a spinal deformity surgeon who is a freshly minted neurosurgeon. He graduated from Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville about one year ago and uh, just completed his complex deformity fellowship with Ron Lehman and Dan Brew and Dr. Larry Lanky uh, just a couple of months ago. And now he's an attending neurosurgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. So we're really excited to have him here to talk about uh, some of the research that he's done with surgical simulation. Thanks a lot for being here, Bill. Yeah, thanks so much, Michael. I appreciate the invite. And uh, you know, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys about some of the research that um, I uh, completed in residency and that I'm hoping to continue here at the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, today's talk is going to be focused on surgical simulation. And um, you know, the last few years, simulation has become a really popular name, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, but my whole uh, goal in research and in um, innovation is to move this past kind of the uh, theatrical phase that it is now and more into a basic science uh, research category. And so I'm going to talk to you guys today about um, my research in that and hopefully uh, be able to motivate some people to, to jump in and do the same thing. So let me see if I can share my screen here. Everyone can see that okay? All right. Yes. Perfect. All right. Perfect. So again, the title of this talk is Surgical, Surgical Simulation as a Basic Science. And um, like I said, I really want to describe my methods for um, turning, you know, surgical simulation, especially in the context of neurosurgical simulation, uh, into something that we can study objectively and not just in the form of Likert scales and what people's perceptions of the simulation are, but actually into the uh, microanatomic details of what we're trying to teach our trainees. So just some disclosures. I do have a few patents related to the research that I'm discussing, and I have a royalty sharing agreement with one of the companies that licenses a patent through uh, Mayo Clinic uh, on some of my inventions. So this whole thing really starts with a question, and it's about something that you really love to do. And when I was a resident, you know, I discovered that I really love spinal deformity surgery. And one of my mentors, Mark Pickleman, was a, a Linky fellow um, back in 2008. And then he, he was my mentor in residency. And I asked him, I said, you know, Mark, how do you know, you know, which curve to fuse? And how do you know how to put these screws in here and all these things? And he said, uh, you know what, Bill, you just got to do it. Get, that was his answer for everything. You just got to do it. And, um, you know, that was frustrating in a way because, you know, I was hoping for some sort of um, esoteric or very straightforward ex explanation about, you know, how he knew just exactly where to put things. And I realized, you know, this really all came down to reps. And, um, you know, the thing about neurosurgery is that, um, you know, resident live OR experience is decreasing compared to previous years. And this has been shown in a few publications, especially in the European literature, that residents graduating um, even before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic were actually uh, having less hands-on experience in the case, even though they were logging cases, they weren't doing much in the case. And rare cases are rare. You know, the things that we see in uh, neurosurgical community don't come along every, every now and then. And that's why a lot of us have to do, you know, fellowships or do an extra year after seven years of training uh, to see some of these uh, uh, deformities and some of these pathologies that only come to certain centers. And the case volume needs are gonna be different for every learner. You know. You, Everyone's had that resident that they see at one time and they can do it probably better than you the next time. And then you've you know, seen maybe it was you that uh, needed to see or do something 10 times before you even got the basics. So it's really hard to tailor training based on one type of personality or one type of learner. So that goes down to what's the fundamental questions of simulation? And these were the questions that I asked myself because I really just wanted more reps to try to understand you know, how to put in pedicle screws, how to do corrections and things like that. Um, and so the fundamental question of simulation is what experience is meant to be brought to the learner? What are you trying to teach them? And the second thing is what learning points are actually being taught? So you have an idea of what you're trying to teach the people, but with the simulation that you're using, what is the applicability of the simulation to meet those goals? And then what is the fidelity 
or the realism of the simulator? And this is probably one of the hardest questions that we have to ask ourselves, especially those of us that are innovators and um, are seeking patents or technology licenses is what are we really teaching people with the things that we're inventing? So let's just talk for a second about fidelity and surgical simulation. Um, I boil it down to three things. The first is anatomy, second thing is physiology, and the third thing is dynamics. So there's a gross anatomical concept that you're trying to teach your trainees, and that's the form, um, shape of the uh, structures that you work around, um, or the morpho morphology of the uh, dorsal structures of the spine and things of that nature. Then there's a physiologic aspect and uh, of the of the uh, tissues that you're trying to simulate, and that's in response to how your tactile feedback is with the simulation. You know the the difference in densities between cortical and cancellous bone. But then there's also a dynamic component. How are those structures changing throughout the course of the surgery, and how do you bring that into surgical simulation? So. In my opinion, I think a true simulation that's showing fidelity and in, in, um, in, in, uh, representing a live operative experience is going to hit all three of these things. So what's our current gold standard? Well, it, it's cadavers, and we use cadavers um, on a very common basis in our courses and in our teaching for our residents. However, there's no regulation right now on cadaver costs, and I can tell you I worked in a simulation center at Mayo Clinic in Florida. Um, and, you know, the costs were different for cadavers every single month, depending on the supply and demand. And there was a uh, Reuters article that was called The Body Trade, and it actually talked about the underground black market uh, for acquiring bodies and um, the, the prices that people were charging to sell to uh, medical education courses. And um, they did a deep dive into this and found that it was completely unregulated by um, any sort of uh, overhead. The average facility requirements for cadavers are well over a million dollars. It's very expensive. And a lot of these times you can't use them in standardized medical device courses because they're being held at hotels or places that can't house human tissue. And only about 20% of acquired cadaveric tissue in the United States is deemed suitable for surgical simulation. And that was based upon that article that was written a few years back. So what features are important for spine surgery in a simulation? So the first thing is going back to the anatomy, so the vertebral anatomy. Um, the gross anatomy of the vertebral body is just the morphology, um, and you can break that down into the cortical bone structures and into the cancellous bone structures. And then there's also this ventral lamina concept, and those of you that are uh, very well versed in freehand pedicle screws know that um, you can actually palpate the ventral lamina while you're putting in um, your probe to know if you're about to have a breach or um, if you're uh, getting close to the spinal canal because uh, as Larry wrote in one of his papers, that ventral lamina is actually uh, a few times thicker than the lateral aspect of the uh, pedicle wall. And, and, you know, that's how you can put in much larger screw diameter than you um, in, than the actual pedicle diameter. So my first uh, goal in creating a surgical simulator was to recreate this concept to try to get the same haptic feedback uh, that you would get either putting a screw in a cadaver or putting a screw in a person. So the first thing that we have to get with that is surface anatomy. So that has to do with the facet interfaces, pedicle shape, and the structural relationships. So there are two basic ways that I could reproduce that. And this was me as a resident figuring out, you know, how can I practice putting in screws other than cadavers because they're so expensive? The first one is an injection molding technique, or we know that as a sawbones model. The issue with that is that you're basically limited to one type of model that you make based on one type of morphology. So you don't have a lot of room for digression for um, pathologic appearance or differences in um, um, scoliosis or things like that that you may want to recreate. Then there's 3D printing. The nice thing about 3D printing is that you can actually take a patient scan and you can turn it into a model that you can um, you know, represent down to the um, millimeter. So it's a, a little bit more um, accurate in re trying to recreate the actual morphology of the spine. And so, you know, I really got into FDM 3D printing and there's, there's two main types of 3D printing. I'm not going to go into all the details, but the cool thing about FDM printing is that it, there's a very diverse thermoplastic selection. And basically how this form of 3D printing works is it's like a hot glue gun that squirts out hot thermoplastic material and goes back and forth on an X and a Y axis. And then as the bed lowers, it basically draws the whole thing and builds it as you go up. And um, this can be accurate to a micrometer level detail. And it's actually a very cheap method of 3D printing. So most desktop 3D printers are going to be uh, FDM 3D printers. 
And my first experiment was, uh, how do I replicate the cortical cancellous interface in this ventral lamina concept so I can learn how to put in screws? And the different thermoplastics um, come in different density differences, and just like the cortical cancellous interface, they have different structural differences and they have different composition differences. So I thought, wow, this might be a great place to start. So I went ahead and actually bought my own 3D printer, set it up in my bedroom. Um, my wife was seven months pregnant at the time and she thought I was absolutely out, out of my mind. And so I just started printing out all these different vertebral models and trying to figure out how could I mimic the difference in density between the cortical surface and the cancellous surface to practice putting in screws. And so my hypothesis was that if I use different types of polymers, different density differences, I could get a haptic feedback that was similar. So I decided to go with polyvinyl alcohol and polylactic acid. Um, polylactic acid has similar um, shore hardness and, and mechanical properties as a cancellous bone. And anyone that's played around 3D printing knows that polyvinyl alcohol is pretty bendy and kind of uh, um, chewy and flexible. So at that point, I was just basing it on uh, density differences. And this was thing was pretty cool. You could actually x-ray it and see what, you know, where you put in the screws and um, it, you know, it worked pretty well. So we, I, we were pretty happy about that. So we started using that for a while and actually a bunch of the residents came over and started learning how to put in screws on these vertebral models. The problem with that is that the print time was really long. It was like eight hours for one vertebral model. And that was fine with me doing it in my bedroom just for myself, but all the other residents wanted to learn how to put in screws on these things too. And so there was this escalating use of these simulators that I was making. And then this was really limited to just one bone type. So I couldn't simulate osteoporotic bone. I couldn't simulate hard bone. I couldn't simulate pediatric bone or, or, or cortical bone with this. And the, uh, the laminectomy simulation that I built was really not up to par. I mean, this stuff would crack every time you would try to, you know, birth through it, and it, it wasn't great. And as you can see here, um, when you put a screw in that was a little bit oversized as the pedicle, the um, differences in the, the laminar density of the uh, thermoplastic as it was layered would actually split. So when the pedicle screw went in, the whole vertebral model would just crack all the way through. Um, and you really weren't able to get that same haptic feedback as uh, putting in a nice strong cortical screw where you get that click, click, click. Um, so I really, you know, that really wasn't that great as far as the fidelity of the simulator. So we kind of burned that up and went back to the drawing board. And so this is really taking this back to hypothesis driven research, you know, um, and, and going back to having something that you're trying to trying to prove and see and, uh, if it's going to work and going back to the scientific method. So my hypothesis was, was that a polymer or polymers with similar material properties to cortical and cancellous bone would, would provide a high fidelity representation. So at that point, it wasn't just about the density differences in the printing, it was more about the actual mechanical and molecular properties. So we started playing around with this polyisocyanate foam, um, which is a porous polymer and has a density range of actually normal cancellous tissue. And the really cool thing about this foam is that the polymerization could be modulated um, to uh, different porous densities. So you could simulate completely cortical bone and, and osteoporotic bone. And we actually got this published in a nature subjournal um, because we really focused on the basic science and 3D printing technique of this. And what we found was that the residents got a great haptic feedback about really palpating that ventral lamina while being able to slide into that cancellous bone. And again, this wasn't due to the cortical uh, or to the cortical cancer cells density difference. It was it was really about the binding and the molecular um, and the uh, 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 the microscopic structure of this. And if you notice in this picture, this is a three D or this is a slice through one of these three D printed vertebrae. This three D printing technique that we invented actually recreated the the thickness density of the ventral lamina compared to the lateral wall. And this was really cool because you're more likely to get lateral breaches than medial breaches when you put in your screws. So the residents had a great experience um, putting these screws in. And um, this was a, a presentation where basically um, what we did was we had this massive experiment and we looked at these single material prints that a couple other people were doing. It was myself and then this guy, Michael Bull, um, who was a good friend of mine. And he was at the Barrow University um, doing similar research at the same time as me. So basically did a study um, that was trying to recreate the study that Larry did back in 2014, which showed that these, the pedicle will actually dilate in response to um, a larger screw diameter because of this ventral lamina concept. So I wanted to take this vertebrae and see, okay, the anatomy is good, the physiology is good, but what are the dynamics of this vertebral model property? Does it mimic human tissue? So we basically printed three distinct um, 
uh, human thoracic spines. And then we did one with a single material, like the first experiment I described. And then we did another one with a dual material. And then we put pedicle screws in each one of these vertebral models, starting with 4.5 millimeters. And we upsized all the way to nine millimeters. So we put in like 900 screws in these things. And then we looked at pedicle failure. So the pedicle failure was defined as a visual breakage of the 3D printed model. And we looked at where these things broke. So bottom line is we put in a bunch of these pedicle screws and the average pedicle screw diameter inserted was significantly higher in the dual material cohort. So using a 3D printed model with two very, very distinct thermoplastic materials actually replicated the expansion of the pedicle um, just like the human bone did. And so this was really, really cool. And you can see here, this is uh, on the top uh, left picture is one of those uh, single print materials that were used uh, density differences. And you can see the, the twisting motion of the screw actually delaminates the 3D printed structure. Whereas if you can see in the bottom, um, actually the, uh, the medial border of the pedicle is spared, but then you get this lateral bending and cracking of the pedicle just like you would in an actual uh, cadaver. And that's what uh, Larry's study uh, back in 2014 showed as well. So we basically measured this and tailored this according to Larry's study, and we, and we based it off of that, and we found that it was basically the, the exact same, um, the graphs, they, they almost uh, correlated perfectly. So our conclusions was that this combined thermoplastic model demonstrated pedicle plasticity. So this was the first time in simulation history where we actually had a 3D printed model that demonstrated similar physiologic properties to uh, human tissues. So we were really, really excited about this. But now we still had this problem of total spine dynamics. So we got the bone down, but anyone can put in a pedicle screw when the bone's sitting there right in front of you. But what about when the hole is this deep and you haven't exposed everything completely? And this isn't a new problem. Um, this is also a paper by one of my buddies, uh, John Stone, who's also uh, done a lot of research about 3D printing. And um, he was a, a huge encouragement for me. And he was kind of the impetus for me getting into this with some of his work. And he looked at using um, polymer hydrogels to replicate skin, fat, and tissue to kind of that work in a whole concept uh, to teach residents to do surgery. And you know, this was uh, um, something that we were lacking from um, some of our simulators, and especially with concepts of, of using electrocautery. So how could you find a polymer that would be able to be you know, um, stable, but also you could use electrocautery and dissect? Going back to the hypothesis-driven research, we tried to figure out if you had a conductive flexible polymer, this could provide a base material for soft tissue simulation, add this to the, um, the bone simulation that we already had, and we could make a pretty awesome simulator. So we went back to the lab again, and um, I have a little background in organic chemistry, and I played around with these uh, polymer hydrogels. And one of the things that uh, me and my friend Aaron Damon, who I think is on the call right now, um, he uh, has a little bit of an engineering background and um, he was my co-inventor with this. We basically created this polymerization technique um, with a polymer hydrogel that was non-toxic, biodegradable, had a high conductivity, it was compatible with electric cautery. And instead of having to do a freeze-thaw process like other hydrogels and simulators would take days to weeks, uh, we could do this in seconds. So we actually invented an inorganic technique of polymerization of these hydrogels so we could build simulators in minutes instead of days. Um, and this could be tailored to the desired tissue properties. We could use the same polymer to create skin, fat, and muscle um, and apply that to our bone simulation, which we already had, you know, to make a full simulator. So this is a quick video just showing a, one of the posterior cervical simulators. So you can see one of the residents using electric cautery to uh, dissect out the posterior elements of the cervical spine. And we also had some features in here, which we had a little bit of bleeding. So the resident would have to clear blood from the operative field. Um, you could put in screws into the bone. You had the same haptic feedback as you would get um, putting in uh, screws into C2 with the cortico cortico-caselis interface. Um, and you can see here having to clear blood from the field, putting in pedicle screws at C7 and T1, putting in lateral mass screws. Um, and then you could also do a cervical laminectomy. The nice thing about this was that we could actually recreate the ligament and flavum so we could teach residents to do on-block uh, lamina uh, resections. And so that you could actually go through and actually just kind of bounce that drill uh, right off the ligament and flavum, just like you would um, in a real person. So they could get that same haptic feedback of going cortical to cancellus to cortical to ligament and then stop. Um, and the, uh, the dura that we have here um, is a, it's a synthetic um, silastic polymer. 
and uh, we filled it with spinal fluid and you can get CSF leaks and things like that. This was uh, another, I believe this was the lumbar simulation that we had. This is another posterior cervical simulation basically showing the same thing. Um, and then at the end, you could actually see that these things are uh, fluoroscopic. Um, let's see if we can pull that up here. Here we go. So you can actually take x-rays at the end and you can see where the residents uh, or fellow screws are. And then you can actually ask them to judge their own screw breaches and say, what do you think about this screw? What do you think about that screw? Um, and then you can actually take the simulator out and then look and see where the breaches occurred for an even more in-depth uh, feedback after the simulation was over. This was a, a lumbar simulation that we had. Let me see if I can go back to that, show you guys. So you can see here the uh, lumbar spine can be exposed. You can do localization. You can grade residents and fellows on their localization skills based on sacrum. Um, you can do a laminectomy in a similar manner that you would do it in a uh, in vivo situation. You know, you can use rongeurs. The bone um, doesn't crack and split. It actually just kind of breaks like it normally would in a, in a person. You can see the cancellous bone here. And then you can actually use a burr to drill all this stuff away and then all the way down to the ligament. And what we were able to do is actually put the ligament into a position into the lateral recess, um, as well as into the superior two thirds of the lamina and have it be dehiscent in the midline, as well as absent at the upper part of the lamina, just like it is uh, in vivo. So you can see here, this is the resident burring away the ligament or burring away the um, a lamina all the way down to the ligament, leaving the superior part of the lamina intact, freeing it up with a curette. And then you can see uh, doing a medial facetectomies with the uh, kerosene. And this was really neat because you're able to teach residents how to, you know, heal down, scoop under the lamina, um, and then also watch out for the dura and be careful. So here's a separation of the ligament and flavum over the dura. Bill, this is absolutely fantastic. There's a couple of questions in the chat box just while you're being yeah. Someone had asked about the um, the time it takes to actually create one of these models and what would what would the the cost be for uh, you know a standard thoracic or cervical model such as this? Yeah, that's a great question. And so the the nice thing about this was well, the nice and bad thing about this was I actually uh, fronted all this with my own money, um, so I had to make it really cheap. And um, what we did was we basically took uh, regular household products uh, and created our own polymer hydrogels. Um, and then when we were able to do our tissue synthesis, we, the reaction that we created would tailor them based on the tissue properties off the same polymer. So all that's just a fancy way to say that this is super cheap. So one of these simulators, um, the print time for the vertebral models um, is probably about six hours to print to put the simulator together, to assemble the whole thing once the printing is done is about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and the entire cost of one of these simulators is about 30 to $50. So everything that you're seeing right now, the total cost of this is 30 to $50. So for almost a year, I was paying for this myself until I ended up getting a grant uh, to continue to build these things for the residents at my program. And the, uh, the interns would come over after their day and come over to the sim lab and they would just operate on these things for, for hours and hours and hours. And it was super cheap. And it was something that I could afford to, to pay out of my own pocket. And the reason why I did it was because I believed in the research um, and I wanted to keep it going until I could uh, get enough evidence to, to apply for a grant, which I eventually did um, in my chief year. So hopefully that, that answers uh, everybody's question for, as regarding that. Do you, do you have anything else you want me to answer? I was just curious on? how long it takes for you to actually build one of these models. About uh, so the whole time, so print time is about six hours, and then the actual assembly of the model is about 30 to 40 minutes. So, what we would do, we would just keep our printer running because the longest thing to make was the bone. So, we would have this whole big bin fu full of different vertebrae. And then, when the resident said, Hey, man, I want to come over and do a sim later this afternoon, um, me and my lab partner, we would just come over about an hour before they wanted to come over, put the thing together, and then have it completely ready for them, prepped and draped. They would come over and operate on it, and then that'd be it. So I could go see my patients in clinic, do a case or whatever, come over, you know, 30 minutes to an hour before they got there, assemble the, the entire thing. And then that was pretty much it. So and, that and was a nice, yeah, go ahead. Specific models as well. I'm sorry. You're able to make uh, like patient specific models as well. Like if they have like some, you know, gnarly curve or something. You're exactly. Able to... And then exactly. 
about for oncology? Like, is there any applications where you could, you could somehow, you know, put a, a synthetic tumor in the intradural space or vertebral body, or have you not gotten there yet? No, no. So one of the first models I made was an intramedullary tumor simulator. And we actually made it so that you could, you could, and I don't have the video on this presentation and I should have included, I didn't think I'd have enough time, but you could actually stimulate each one of the nerve roots and find the phylum terminale for a uh, mixed papillary pendymoma. And then there, we had a light board with L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, and we put them in anatomical order. So you'd actually have to find the nerve roots and stimulate them. And then when you stimulate them on the light board, they would light up. And then we made it so that the phylum actually wouldn't stimulate and the tumor was coming from the phylum. And you could resect it with a bipolar and then you could resect it in an unblocked fashion while preserving the nerve roots. So we, we actually probably had three or four simulators where we simulated um, intramedullary spinal cord tumors um, where you could actually do a myelotomy and take the tumor out. Um, we had a couple of brain tumor simulators uh, where you could you know, use the bipolar, find the planes for, for brain tumor metastases. And then we had um, the uh, mixopapillary ependymoma simulator, and then you could do the watertight dural closure. The cool thing about the mixopapillary simulator is you could actually use intraoperative ultrasound. So after you did the laminectomy, it looked exactly like, uh, like, a, like a real tumor. So you could see all the nerve roots and then you'd find the tumor to plan your durotomy. And um, we made a, a, a nice video on that. And I'm um, sorry I didn't include that in my presentation. I think that would have been really cool. Uh, but we're planning on publishing that in the next few months as well. So the, the other thing that uh, I think is really neat about this um, uh, simulator is that you can also uh, do complication management. So, uh, you know, as the resident's taking bites in the lateral recess or underneath the lamina, if they haven't burned enough or freed up the ligament enough, you know, they can get derotomies with these simulators. And as you can see here, um, you know, they're about to take a not so great bite. And then after this, you can use a microscope and then you can repair the, uh, the dura and then you can grade them on their dura repair and then you can test whether it's going to be a watertight or not. And then you can, you know, critique them on their, um, on their technique as far as that goes. So this whole process took us about a good 18 months to fully come to fruition. And, um, you know, now we have these fully functioning simulators, uh, which are, um, you know, we have 10 fully functional ones, and then we have 20 plus more prototypes that we're currently still making. Um, and then one of the ones that I'm most proud of right now is a um, adolescent and pediatric scoliosis model where you can practice curve correction um, and um, uh, compression distraction techniques, rod rotation, derotation maneuver techniques. So you can use this for fellowships to teach residents some of the more finer details of scoliosis correction uh, that they may just have to learn in the operating room and you definitely can't learn on a cadaver. So just putting all this together. So we created a course once we had all these things set up and we had 14 international participants from um, different countries. And what we looked at was um, satisfaction ratings. Um, we looked at uh, Likert scales, fidelity of the simulator compared to previous cadaveric sessions that we were having um, at Mayo Clinic once or twice a month. And then we looked at a cost analysis of what it would take to, if we only did these simulators for cervical and um, lumbar instrumentation and decompression techniques versus if we did them on cadavers. So we had this curriculum that we already did on cadavers at Mayo Clinic. We did this for all our visiting um, residents and for our, our uh, fellows while I was there because I was one of the leaders of it. And then one day we just said, okay, like, instead of doing that, let's just do it on these simulators. And we found that we had more than $10,000 in cost saving for one of these sessions. And we found that these uh, participants who had previously participated in one or more of our cadaver courses um, found that the simulators actually more resembled an intraoperative uh, scenario rather than the cadavers, um, you know, because the, the cadaver bone is often fragile and, you know, the specimens are variable. So the, what the survey showed was they, they actually preferred the simulator to the cadaver um, with regards to instrumentation and, um, and uh, haptic feedback. So this is all, you know, well and good. You know, I've been talking a lot about myself and a lot about the things that we've done, which are, you know, really cool. But what I want to encourage everyone on this talk is, is, is to really think about how you personally could start a simulation program at your residency or your fellowship. And it doesn't have to be something that's super innovative or super amazing. It can be something very simple. 
um, just like a, a basic anatomy course or a basic uh, instrumentation course, because we've seen um, from these courses that have been going on uh, for the last, I guess, I guess it's been 10 or 15 years now with these intern boot camps that we've seen a, a huge increase in the abilities of interns going into their PGY2 year, going to these uh, courses and learning these things. So, you know, I wanted to spend the rest of this talk just to tell you guys about my journey in developing a simulation program into developing a laboratory and how I've found kind of my research niche in doing this. So starting a simulation program really hinges on three things. And the first thing and the most important thing is having a learner goal. If you go in and you just say, I want to teach residents and fellows to be better surgeons, you're going to fail miserably because that is something you can't do. What you have to do is you have to create very specific learning goals and you have to start very small. So the first learning goal may be, I want my residents and fellows to understand pedicle anatomy. And then you can tailor courses and tailor um, materials based on that. Or you can say, I want my residents and fellows to understand how to put in pedicle screws better. And then you can go from there. And then you have to think about what are the resources that you have at your institution to make these things happen. Um, and you may have to partner with industry or um, other places like you know, Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic that, that have these sort of resources to, to make these things happen. And that kind of goes into what support. You know, what support do you have uh, from yourself, from your, your fellow faculty members in creating a, a course or creating a simulation program? Um, and, and I had great support from my friend and my partner, Aaron Damon, um, who uh, was my lab partner through all of this and, and helped me invent all these things. Um, so you have to have someone who's a partner with you and, and willing to, to help you through this so that you go through all the hard startup times with someone to support you. Our lab was called the Brain Lab. It was the Biotechnology Research and Innovation Neuroscience Laboratory. This is a logo that we created for it. And, you know, I would encourage everyone who's interested in surgical innovation to really start thinking about uh, simulation as a potential venue for this. Everyone's interested in instrumentation. Everyone's interested in biologics. Everyone's interested, instru uh, interested in all these interoperative things. But simulation is sort of this gold rush right now that's this untapped market of innovation that for people who are really interested in resident education um, can really make a name for themselves with their, you know, with, uh, with innovation products. This was a paper that we published in Simulation in Healthcare, and we took a really deep dive into the cost of what it what it took for us to, to develop this, um, and then all the steps that we that we took to, to make this happen at our institution. So um, I'd encourage everyone who is uh, interested in doing something like this to, to read about it. And then um, you know we've there's a lot of resources um, on the internet and online that's open that are open access that can be beneficial for you when you're starting your simulation program. This was something that we published that's open access called the Spine Box. And basically what we did was we created um, a 3D uh, model of a lumbar spine into a, a box. And we already programmed the G code, we programmed the printer specifications, and we put this as an open access file online so that people could literally click on it, download it to their 3D printer and print it on their desk. And um, I actually got several emails during the pandemic from programs over in Europe uh, who don't really have a lot of access to cadaveric tissue telling me that this box that they downloaded it and printed on their desktop printers and they were using it to teach their residents how to put in pedicle screws. So, you know, there's a lot of these resources online that people um, are, are doing right now that you could tap into and just develop uh, right now at your, at your institution for, for absolutely free. So I would, you know, encourage you guys to look at the, the resources that are available. And if you have any questions, um, please also feel free to contact me um, about those things as well. So just to wrap up the talk, um, simulation you know, is a form of research. This is a form of basic science research. And we have to move from the hokey theatrical productions that you know, we, we do for uh, certain simulations into what is the actual biochemical fidelity that we are um, giving to our residents that it can replicate intraoperative environments. And if done correctly, this can be a powerful adjunct to trainee education. And there's significant cost savings for instrumentation teaching for uh, institutions, with, especially within spine surgery. So anyway, thank you so much for having me on this talk. I'm super excited to share with you guys the, the things that I've been working on. And um, 
I hope you were just as excited about this talk than my uh, three-year-old was about her ice cream cone over here in Cleveland during the summer. So um, anyways, thank you guys so much for the invitation and um, I'll open up the floor to any questions that you may have. No, thanks. That was, that was really fantastic. That was a really unique talk that you gave us. You know, usually we've got case-based discussions and whatnot. This was something that was kind of a little bit off the beaten path for virtual spy. I, I think it was absolutely awesome. Um, you know, I'm personally very invested in surgical video education for residents and fellows. So th this is something I think that kind of parallels that to some degree. Um, curious, Alex or Mike, if you guys have any questions for Bill and, and uh, you know, how you could potentially see this impacting, you know, your trainees in your respective countries. Yeah, hello, Bill. This is Alexander from Switzerland. It's really amazing. I uh, I am really interested in this um, simulating system since years, and um, we have this big company who is uh, selling um, uh, spine models. Uh, I think Roger Hertel is uh, one of the um, leading promoters um, of his T lift model, and you can simulate everything with this. Uh, and we uh, we we used it um, here as well. And I think what is most important is that um, it is possible to use these simulators in every room. You don't need to have a lab. You don't need to have a, a special room. And um, from the ethical point of view, it's because you're only dealing with plastics. Uh, it's so easy. And we, <laughs> during the pandemic, um, we, we were uh, introducing endoscopy in our hospital. And it is only possible with these simulators. I, I can't imagine that it is better with a cadaver. Um, would you try to uh, visit a cadaver lab um, still, or do you think, well, this technique, I will build up my own simulator if you have the chance to, to go into any new technology? Um, do, you, do you think there's a need for cadaver labs in 10 years? Absolutely. Um, there are certain things that, you know, we haven't gotten to the point where we can recreate. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the, the microanatomy, the microvascular structure of the nerves and the spinal cord. We haven't gotten there yet, but that's why I give these talks. I want to encourage people to continue to further this research so that we don't have to use cadavers anymore, because I personally believe with what I've seen, the technology exists for us to be able to do that, but there's not enough people that are pushing the field forward in simulation to be able to do that for our trainees. And with all the technology that we have available to us right now, um, I really think that the whole Mayo philosophy of um, the needs of the patient comes first and that there's no excuse today for the learners to learn on the patient, um, that we have the technology and resources to make surgery safer for our patients and also to make training a better experience um, for our trainees. And you know, with if simulation can get to the point where we can simulate these microanatomical details, we could possibly even cut down on the years of training for a lot of these, you know, uh, complex things that we do. And I don't think we're near that right now, but I think if we got enough people that are interested in pushing this forward, that one day we actually could get there. So I'll answer your, I answered your question with a few different, you know, <laughs> you know, questions, but I think the, the long short answer of it is no, we're not there yet. But I hope that within my lifetime, we can get there. And that's one of the goals of my career is to try to make that happen. Did you sometimes raise the tension in your uh, training when the resident is there that you simulate also special um, scenes in the operating room like stress? Um, and do, you, do you flow the, the situs with blood, uh, artificial blood? And just to make a simulation of these uh, moments we don't love, but we have to face sometimes in the OR. Yes, we had actually a great durotomy simulator where um, I actually made it so that there was a, a blood coming up from the epidural space. And as soon as they got a durotomy, the blood would just rush into the field and you couldn't see anything. And then there were nerve roots and they had to, you know, tack the dural edges up, control the epidural bleeding. Um, and as soon as the dura, they got it watertight, the dura would re-expand. I had a little hole underneath where the blood would come out and then the dura would re-expand and close the hole and then the epidural bleeding would stop. And these were pretty simplistic simulator designs, but 
out of all the simulators that I made, that was the most stressful for all the residents because as soon as it happened, all the blood coming into the field and every and everyone that did it freaked out. And it, I thought for sure it would be the tumor simulator or the or the pedicle screw simulator, but it really it really was that added um, blood that did it. So yes, we we did have some things like that that would simulate intraoperative stress. I mean, I didn't personally you know scream or yell at them. Um, I think they were stressed enough as it is, but um, you know, I, in in these situations, you know, we we can replicate some of those details and. Um, you know, another great thing would be while you're operating to say, hey, the patient's bradycardic and hypertensive, what just happened? You know, what'd you do? Or, hey, we lost monitoring on this. You know, what do you do? Do you check your screw? So, yeah, that opens up the field to uh, a lot of different areas of the simulation that aren't necessarily applicable to the anatomy, but also to the, uh, the real life scenarios, like you mentioned. Yeah, I think this is this is a, a so important because you can see um, the anatomic skills, the knowledge of your residents, but what is the character of your residents in such a situation? Can you trust him that he will be calm enough to, to cope with the situation or not? And I think this is um, a dimension of simulation, which is, uh, which is so important. It's um, I um, when you when you um, did all your um, <clears throat> testing, what kind of material is the best? Uh, did you always um, try because this was a question from the from the chat was, uh, what is um, the material doing under fluoroscopy? What is the behavior um, in the simulation or um, did you leave some materials because it was perfect from the tactile uh, component, but it was not good? from the fluoroscopy? Yeah, we went through a lot of different thermoplastics before we found one that the tactile feedback uh, matched the in vivo scenario, uh, but also was fluoroscopic compatible. Um, and we also CT'd these. We have a study that's that we're going to hopefully publish soon, which actually shows that you can use robotics and navigation on these things. So you can actually register a robot um, and navigation to these simulators and then use, you don't have to just use freehand technique, you can use it for those things as well. So the CT uh, properties, as well as the fluoroscopic properties um, mimic uh, real tissue. And I have a publication that shows the fluoroscopic capabilities, but we're planning on publishing the CT study pretty soon. Bill, Dr. Baracek, in, um, he's, he's one of the neurosurgeons that's in our audience. He had asked about if you can maybe expand a little bit more about how you can simulate neuromonitoring. I know with that, um, that mixopapillary pendymoma case, you had mentioned it a little bit, but is there any way to simulate anything a little bit more advanced, uh, like dorsal column mapping or anything along those lines? Yeah, we haven't gotten there yet, but the cool thing about the polymer that we invented is that... Um, you know, it's extremely conductive. I mean, it was as it was more conductive than copper. Um, so we did a bunch of uh, different uh, um, electrodiagnostic, you know, tests on it. And uh, so that was kind of the next phase that we're trying to get to is how much more detail and how much more granularity can we get with our simulation to make it more effective uh, to teaching residents these techniques. So the, the technology is there, um, but the simulator design uh, hasn't been built yet. But those are things that I'm really interested in partnering with people about um, that have the bandwidth to, to want to build these things. Because like I said, the, the material is there. It's just a matter of designing the simulator. So I think the, the, the golden question is, what are your plans to commercialize this? I don't know if you're allowed to reveal that, but I'm, I'm very curious. So if we want to get our hands at UNC on one of your models or maybe multiple of your models, how could we go about doing that in the future? So right now, um, everything is through Mayo Clinic because that's where I invented it. Um, so Mayo Clinic holds the patent on that. And I, uh, they have a licensing agreement right now with a company called Simdury. Um, it's a, 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 they do uh, uh, augmented reality and some you know, virtual simulation stuff. And so they're kind of toying around with the idea right now. Um, it's still in its baby stages, so they haven't gotten it to a full production capability. When I was at Mayo Clinic before my fellowship, we were using these things every single day because I was building them. So they're trying to uh, standardize the process of making these to be able to make them commercially available. My goal for the simulation myself is to make these affordable uh, models that you can ship anywhere in the world so that places that don't have access to cadavers or don't have access to 
um, a lot of the cases that you know we do at certain you know tertiary institutions like the one I work at right now uh, can learn these things. So I would say that for me, um, you know, much to my uh, patent holders' uh, chagrin, I'm a little more on the altruistic side at, at making this a little bit more available. But um, you'll have to stay tuned for more information about you know the commercialization process right now. But uh, I will say that I did I did talk with some of the folks at uh, Ohio State, um, and we are planning on trying to combine forces to do a, a Midwestern spine course with some of these models uh, once I can get some of my lab materials back up to Cleveland. Bill, I, I guess you have, uh, with your lab, you uh, have been the teacher of the year for, for many months because I guess the residents were loving these. Uh, vice versa, did you notice a, a, a better progress of your residents in the OR? Um, it's hard to measure this, but could you say that maybe oh, this, um, like the class of uh, 2023 is a little bit faster than five years ago to, what, to compare? So I think it's really, you know, it'd be really easy for me to say, yeah, yeah, they got so much better. But I mean, that's just so, to, if you're an honest person, that's so hard to judge, right? Because I mean, we, we have a hard time doing that as it is. But what I noticed was that their confidence was better. So when they were repairing Dura in the operating room, they had more, they had more confidence. They were like, oh, I've done this before. And I think that the confidence, um, either it, maybe it was skill that they acquired from the simulator, or maybe it was just the fact that they felt like they could do it. But I subjectively felt like they were better at doing certain tasks because they had felt like they had done them before in an environment which somewhat replicated an intraoperative environment. So I personally noticed that in my cases, and I would say that dural repair was one of the things that I think I noticed the most difference with. So what about navigation? Dr. Berichek was asking about that. You may or may not have mentioned that a little bit earlier today. Yeah, so I, I touched on this briefly, but uh, we just did a study where we looked at the, uh, the CT properties of this uh, model. And what we found was that you could actually register these simulators on a navigation system or a robotic system. So um, with uh, trying to teach CT-based navigation, it's possible on these simulators, and we have done that. Awesome. Well, Bill, that was absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much for being here and, uh, you know, discussing with us your research. You're obviously very passionate about it. And I think we all look forward to, um, you know, seeing what the future holds for, for your patents and maybe how we could get our hands on some of these models in the future for our trainees. So if no one else has any other questions, I, I think we'll probably... Um, We'll call it a night and um, or a morning for those of you guys who are in Stockholm or overseas. So thanks again for joining us, Bill. And I'm not sure what's up for next week, but you guys just stay tuned for Twitter and um, something in the next couple of days. Thanks again, everybody, for having me. It was it was an amazing talk and uh, amazing just getting to see everybody's faces that I've uh, that I've met online. So uh, really appreciate you guys having me. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. We'll be in touch, buddy. All right. Take care.